The Scandinavian Star is an ocean-going ferry. For 19 years, she carries thousands of passengers and vehicles across the seas. Until a routine crossing turns deadly for 482 people in just 45 minutes. Now, using cutting-edge computer technology, we reveal exactly what went wrong. Disasters don't just happen, they're a chain of critical events. Unravel the fateful decisions in those final seconds from disaster. Norway. Oslo. Friday, April 6th, 1990. It's the start of the Easter holidays, and after a brand new renovation, the 142 meter long cruising ferry Scandinavian Star has just joined the popular route between Norway and Denmark. She's due to depart from Oslo at 7.30 p.m., carrying cars and 383 passengers and 99 crew. But the loading of the ship falls behind schedule. Waiting in a car on the dock with her family is Heidi Jensen. She was just 11 years old. We heard about the delay, so my mother and brother went on board while my dad and I waited. He'd been a sailor and I had lots of silly questions to ask him. I asked him about the lifeboats and if he had been in one and, and what it was like. And I remember he said he wouldn't recommend it. Despite the delay, the passengers are looking forward to an uneventful 13-hour voyage. A restful week beckons for Jan Harsum, his pregnant wife Christine, and their one-and-a-half-year-old son, Halvor. We decided to go on Easter vacation to have some fun. We were looking forward to it, because we were expecting that summer to be very busy. Spring was in the air. There was a nice atmosphere. The weather was clear. Perfect conditions for the 12,500 ton Scandinavian star. Built in 1971, she's a nine-deck vessel. Deck three carries cars and trucks in the center and is lined around its edges by two decks of passenger cabins. But most of the passenger cabins are on deck five. There are three decks above these with lounges, shops, a restaurant, bar and disco. These are put to good use on a route well known for its duty-free party atmosphere. The bridge housing the ship's main controls is on deck eight. On duty that night is Hugo Larsen. The passengers are in safe hands. He's been a ship's captain for 22 years. Nine forty-five p.m. The mooring lines are cast off, and the Scandinavian Star finally gets underway. Two hours, 15 minutes late. But on board. All is not as it should be. The interior renovation is unfinished and there's confusion over the simplest tasks. Jan Hassem has already had a mix-up over his cabin number and at reception the problems continue. Then the key we were given wasn't the right one so I had to go all the way back to reception again to get a new key. Even an 11-year-old can see that all is not right on the ship. The crew didn't understand Norwegian or English or anything and were running about looking very stressed. But soon, the disorganization seems little more than an inconvenience. They put the problems behind them and begin to enjoy the restaurant, bar and other facilities on board. I was looking forward to going to the tax-free shop and doing some shopping. It's the sort of thing girls that age enjoy. I didn't want to stay in the cabin. That was boring. It's midnight. The younger passengers like Heidi are in bed. 
Jan Hassan is restless and leaves his wife and young son to sleep in their cabin on deck five. Our son Halvor was only little and needed to sleep, so I walked around the ship a bit, just observing people and situations, and it seemed as if people were settling in. The Scandinavian star is now at her cruising speed of 21 knots. The sea is calm, the night clear. The gentle motion of the ship promises a good night's sleep for the passengers already in their cabins. Yet, for some of them, their fate has already been sealed. 2 a.m. The Scandinavian star has been underway for four and a quarter hours. Those passengers who are still awake are having a good time in the ship's bar and disco on deck eight. But five decks below, a small fire breaks out in a corridor on deck three. The fire takes hold and gains strength. It creeps up the walls and along the ceilings. The passengers on the decks above sleep on or party. By 2.09 a.m., the fire reaches into a stairwell and begins to climb through the ship's interior, setting fire to deck four above. Still, none of the passengers have any idea that beneath their feet, the fire is eating its way through the ship. And neither does Captain Larsen up on the bridge of the Scandinavian star. Despite the smoke and flames of the growing inferno, no one has yet seen the fire and raised the alarm. A group of young athletic students are enjoying the freedom of the ship on their way to a training camp. One of them is Vidar Skillingsass. He was just 14 years old. For a 14-year-old traveling without parents to Denmark, along with the rest of the gang, it was very exciting. And clearly, not having to go to bed when our parents would have told us to was great. So we could explore the ship's facilities, like the disco and slot machines. 2.11 a.m. Suddenly, Vidar and his friends notice smoke pouring from a stairwell on deck five. We saw smoke rising from the floor below, so we went straight down to reception. Solvi Egerhot is on duty at reception on deck five. Three boys came running towards me and they were screaming, there's a fire. At first they didn't take us seriously, but then they saw the smoke following us. I saw the smoke billowing after them. It was so thick I could barely make them out. And I stood there thinking, we can't deal with this. We're going straight to hell. So I call the bridge, call Captain Larsen, and tell him there's a fire raging on the stern deck. It's 2.15 a.m. and finally, 15 minutes after the fire has ignited, Captain Hugo Larsen gets his first warning. Simultaneously, warning alarms, which only sound on the bridge, go off as other people see smoke and raise the alarm by hitting the emergency switches. But Captain Larsen has no idea of the scale of the fire. Every decision he makes, every turn of events over the next 30 minutes will affect the lives of the 482 people on board. A fire has broken out on the passenger ship Scandinavian Star. Two of the eight decks are ablaze. And 482 people are in grave danger. Two fifteen a.m. Fire alarms go off on the bridge to warn the captain. On most ships, this is the only place they can be heard. Captain Larsen immediately begins to close fire doors one by one using the remote controls on the bridge. This is standard safety procedure on a ship to stop the fire spreading through the interior. This course of action will turn out to be a vital clue in the investigation that follows. Next, he sounds the ship's general alarm to alert everyone on board that there is a fire. 
This warning signal should be audible throughout the ship. Two twenty a.m. Three decks below the captain, on deck five, Jan Harsum is woken by his pregnant wife. They're sharing a cabin with their one and a half year old son, Halvor. And then I see Christine leave the cabin. And I pick up Halvor on my arm and leave. The moment I get out into the corridor, I realize I've come straight from a deep sleep into something I really cannot comprehend. Because I cannot see anything. There's smoke everywhere, like a thick, thick fog. So I can't even see the walls of the corridor around me. All Jan can do is grab his son and run through the thick smoke, trusting his memory of the ship's layout. He can't even see his wife Christine, who has left the cabin just seconds before him. By now, the fire is a raging inferno, and it spits out a fireball that races across an open area from one side of the ship to the other on deck five. Both sides are now ablaze. The fireball passes only meters from the closed door of the cabin where 11-year-old Heidi Jensen and her family are sleeping. The corridor outside is almost engulfed by the flames. I just stood there screaming and staring into a wall of flames. There was lots of crackling. It was horrible. And then my dad gave me a push in the back and I ran. That was the worst bit, running away from the flames. And when I got upstairs, I thought they were following me. Frightened Heidi runs straight into a group of fleeing passengers who lead her to the relative safety of the lifeboats on deck seven. The fire is now burning on decks three, four, and five. The staircase acts as a chimney, sucking the fire upwards. It continues to climb, igniting the restaurant on deck six. Coughing frantically, Jan Hasse manages to find his way out into the fresh air at the back of the ship on deck five. But his pregnant wife is missing. Leaving his son with others, Jan tries desperately to find her. I attempted to go back down the stairs again with the intention of looking for Christine. But I was met with such a mighty burst of smoke that came up the stairs that I remember the thought occurring to me that if I do not turn around and go back up now, then Halvor will lose me as well. 2.24 a.m. On the bridge of the blazing Scandinavian star on deck eight, Captain Larsen has no accurate information on where the fire has reached or how fast it is spreading. Realizing the situation is out of control, he sets his VHF radio to the international emergency frequency, channel 16. Mayday, mayday, mayday. He sends out a mayday to any ships in the area. It's the most extreme distress signal at sea. Mayday, mayday, mayday. To make it easier to launch the lifeboats, Captain Larsen also cuts the engines. The Scandinavian star is now adrift, approximately 30 kilometers from the nearest port, Lissakil, in Sweden. By 2.30 a.m., the ventilation is off, another safety procedure. Unfortunately, this allows smoke to invade the passenger cabins all over the ship through the door vents. The passengers trapped in the cabins are in a terrifying situation. They have nowhere to run. In desperation, those awake seek refuge from the smoke anywhere they can, in the closets, in the showers, but there is nowhere to hide. The ship's crew are in chaos. There are no clear emergency procedures for them to follow. Only a few of the crew think to put on breathing apparatus. They go into the choking smoke-filled interior, searching for survivors. One of them is Staff Captain Kirsten Hansen. He described the awful scene to the ship's receptionist, Solvi Ekerhoff. He had a terrible experience down there. One mother, he said, had sat with her back to the wall, holding her two children. They were dead. He wanted to take her up, but she said, no, let me be. I want to die with my children. And then she died. 2.50 a.m. 
25 minutes after receiving the Mayday distress signal, the ferry Stenosaga is the first ship to arrive on the scene. One of her crew reaches for his video camera and records the sight that greets them. This is the actual video that he recorded. The waters around the blazing ship are filled with drifting lifeboats. The fire is completely out of control. The captain of the Stenosaga, Leonard Nordgren, describes the scene. We saw the whole of the stern ablaze. We could hear people screaming. And we could also hear the noise of the fire itself, a crackling sound, a bit like popcorn. The flames were 12 to 15 meters high. Other vessels join the Stenosaga, and between them, they begin the painstaking job of retrieving the drifting lifeboats. It's 3.20 a.m. Smoke fills the bridge of the Scandinavian star where Captain Larsen stands. He tells Captain Nordgren on the Stena Saga that he must abandon ship. Nordgren knows that the captain should be the last to leave his ship, and he wants to be sure. This is a recording of their actual conversation. Stena Saga, Stena Saga, Scandinavian star. Scandinavian star, Stena Saga. I specifically asked him if everybody had been evacuated, and he answered in his own words, as far as I know, I think everyone has got away. But the truth is that the Scandinavian star's captain has made a fatal mistake. More than 30 people remain. They're trapped outside at the rear of Deck 5 on the ship their captain has abandoned. They can't reach the lifeboats on deck seven. The fire is blocking their way. The water is too cold to jump. Jan Harsum is trapped and desperate to protect his baby son from the inferno. Very heavy smoke rose from all the openings in the ship. The fire had an overwhelming energy to it. We heard what sounded like deep thunder rolling inside the ship. Rescue boats spot them and send lifeboats to the rear of the blazing ship. Jan escapes by climbing precariously down ropes with his young son strapped to him. At this point, the rescuers finally begin to believe that all the passengers are saved. 5.30 a.m. It's at this moment that the first emergency services enter the Scandinavian star. Nine firefighters from Gothenburg, Sweden, are winched onto the deck. Their leader is Fire Chief Ingvar Brynfors. When we made contact with the ship, the sight made our hair stand on end. It was an incredible sight. The sky was blazing red against the black horizon to the west. 7 a.m. The firefighters have been on board for an hour and a half, searching the ship for survivors. They reach the rear section of Deck 5, and are horrified to discover dead bodies everywhere. It was like the gates of hell. People were lying all over the place in the corridors. We broke down the doors so we could get into other places. And there were people lying on their beds, in the lavatories, in the showers. We counted 71 victims in there. The final victim count at the rear of deck five is 76. Nearly half the people who die succumb in this one small area. What made it so dangerous? Survivors are taken by rescue boats to ports in Sweden, Norway, and Denmark. People become separated in the confusion, and many don't even know if their family and loved ones are safe in a different port or left behind on the burning ship. This unique news footage shows Heidi Jensen and her family as they arrive at Sandefjord, Norway. For her father, an ex-sailor, seen here carrying her younger brother, it's all too much. I saw Dad's reaction. He started crying. I think he began to take in what had happened. It had not sunk in before that. But when I saw him reacting in that way, I started thinking it was something big we had experienced, something awful. The firefighters on the Scandinavian star continue to scour the smoking ferry while it's towed to Liskil in Sweden. 
As they widen their search, the number of dead continues to rise. Yan Hassam and his young son reach land. There is still no news of his pregnant wife, Christine. It's almost too much for the human mind to cope with. Had she come out someplace else? Had she been picked up by another craft? After a week of agony, the police deliver the awful news. So Christine's casket and our little son, she was, as I've mentioned, pregnant were then brought to the churchyard in Asker where we lived and placed there. Christine Hassam leaves the same cabin as Jan at the same time, yet he lives and she dies. She's one of a staggering 158 victims that lose their lives in just 45 minutes aboard the Scandinavian Star. Now, by rewinding the events of that fateful day and by going deep into the investigation, we can reveal what truly happened. How did the fire start? Why did so many people die in one small section of the ship? Advanced computer simulation will take us where no camera can go, into the heart of the disaster zone. A team of Scandinavian experts is assembled to investigate the disaster. Using their data, we can piece together the deadly chain of events to find out what caused this terrible tragedy. This is their actual footage of the aftermath. How does this devastating fire start? To find out, they first have to track down where it began, the point of origin. Leading the fire investigation team is the head of the Norwegian Fire Research Institute, Shell schmidt Pedersen. What we were supposed to do is to, to describe the development of the fire, what started the fire, at what time it started, where it started. It's not necessarily easy to find the origin, so you have to go backwards. The whole thing is a puzzle. The investigators track the path of the fire damage through the interior of the wrecked ship. It's like playing the fire backwards, leading them back towards the ignition site, the point of origin. The trail ends in a corridor on deck three. They know that the answer to what starts this devastating blaze must lie in the wreckage of this corridor seen here in their original video. They believe a pattern of burn damage marks the exact spot where the fire started, and they discover traces of linen there. They conclude that the fire was started in a pile of bedding. But what sets the bedding on fire? There was no electrical equipment. There was no heating from the, the chimney case and there was no hydraulic uh, oil system in that corridor. We found no equipment or anything that could have naturally started the fire. Could it have been set accidentally by a passenger or crew member? They discovered that the passenger cabins on deck three were not in use. The deck should have been empty. They're mystified. The truth will only become clear when the investigators unravel all the secrets of the fatal blaze on the Scandinavian star. 2 a.m. Using forensic science, schmidt Pedersen's team calculate that this is the earliest start time for the fire. 45 minutes to disaster. The investigation now focuses on the escalation of the blaze. How did a fire in a simple pile of bedding turn into a massive blaze? that sweeps through the 142-meter-long Scandinavian star. A fatal fire tears through the ferry Scandinavian star. It kills 158 men, women and children and is one of the worst maritime disasters in Scandinavian history. Using advanced computer graphics based on the official report, we go deep into the investigation to unravel the deadly chain of events. What started this awful fire remains unclear. 
Fire investigators do establish that 2 a.m. is the earliest possible moment that the fire began, when a pile of bedding on deck three ignited. But the investigators are puzzled. How did this small fire grow into a massive blaze? To fully investigate the fire on the Scandinavian star and unravel its secrets, they have to recreate the fatal blaze. But this time, in the laboratory. So we had to make a full-scale experiment and with the same um, type of corridor as we had on board the ship because that was important to the development of the fire and with the same material used. Everything the same. The bedding fire alone would have burned out. With the ship's steel walls and fireproof asbestos lining, the fire should have had nowhere to go. And when they examine the burnt out interior, they find the asbestos boards, although buckled, have not burnt. If it isn't the lining boards themselves, what is the fuel source for the fatal blaze? Something is fueling the fire as it races through the ship. The investigators are mystified. They dig deeper. What they discover is that the decorative white finish that covers the asbestos boards has completely disappeared. But this thin lining is barely 1.6 millimeters thick, little more than the thickness of a CD. We have a material that is 1.6 millimeters thick, that is not very much. So the first thing we did is to investigate how is it ignited, what is needed to ignite it, how much heat will it release. Schmidt-Pedersen's experiments reveal that the wall lining is in fact extremely flammable. Calculations show that burning a one meter square piece of this lining turns out to be roughly the equivalent of throwing a liter and a half of petrol into the blaze. The main fuel for the fatal fire is this thin lining. Its only job is to make the ship's interior look good, but the lining is so flammable, the fireproofing of the asbestos is useless. 36 minutes to go. Based on their experiments, Schmidt-Pedersen's group calculate that this corridor lining is now burning out of control. They now know that it fuels the fire. But how does it get beyond the corridor on deck three? Why don't the ship's fireproof bulkheads and fire doors contain the blaze in the corridor? We have two bulkheads on the ship, one here and one here. And they're supposed to divide the ship into three different compartments, giving the result that a fire within one compartment should not spread to the other compartment. Fire doors allow passengers through the bulkheads and subdivide each compartment to contain a fire. But all this is useless if the fire doors are not shut. On the bridge, Captain Larson closes fire doors by remote controls in areas where fire alarms are activated. But on the Scandinavian Star, the passenger area fire alarms are not automatic. They can only be activated manually. It means that doors are only shut in areas where people see the blaze and press the alarm button. And of course, in the area where the, the fire started, there was no one pushing any button. So the doors were kept open. Thirty-six minutes to go. The fire passes through the open fire door and into the rest of the ship. But what puzzles investigators is that the fire seems to reach deck five much more swiftly than it should. And when it gets there, it roars across the ship in a fireball. What makes it spread so rapidly through the interior? Eyewitness testimony is a key part of unraveling the chain of events. 25 minutes. Kristen Blindheim stumbles out of his cabin on deck four towards the nearby staircase. We were only a couple of meters from the stairwell and there was black smoke rolling down the stairs. But hot smoke should rise, not fall. How can Kristen Blindheim see smoke traveling down the stairwell? 
That is um, a bit puzzling that the fire is going like that. So we, we were a bit not surprised, but we thought that that was weird. Investigators follow the trail of the smoke and fire damage downhill. It leads them to this door on deck three, where the passenger area joins the car deck. This photograph from the investigation shows a pattern of fire damage which leads them to believe that the door was partly open during the fire. A further clue comes from the scorched van parked right by the door. This damage can only have been caused by hot gases coming through the door and burning the vehicle. The car deck is ventilated by powerful fans designed to suck dangerous vehicle exhaust fumes out of the ship. But with the fire door to the car deck open during the blaze, these fans are literally sucking the fire through the ship. The fire starts in a corridor on deck three. Within 20 minutes, the airflow sucks the fire up the staircase to deck five. The conditions there transform it into a fireball that roars across the open space on deck five to the stairwell on the other side of the ship. The smoke and flame is then sucked down this stairwell through the open fire door and into the car deck. By the time the ventilation fans are all off, 10 minutes later, it's too late. But what is still a mystery to the investigators is why 39 victims at the back of Deck 5 failed even to get out of their cabins. They focus on how the passengers are alerted. The main warning comes when they hear the ship's alarm. Surely this would have alerted the passengers. The team investigates the layout of the cabins and the positions of the alarm sirens. They discover that for 59% of the occupied cabins in the rear of Deck 5, the sound level of the alarm is less than 57 decibels, substantially quieter than inside a Rolls-Royce traveling down a freeway. The explanation for the sleeping passengers is simple. They probably never heard the alarm. It was just too quiet. Expert fire training officer Chris Harris explains why. It starts off very loud, and it starts traveling down the alleyway. And it has to turn left or right through another alleyway. And it carries on and on and on. But of course, it's passing the cabin doors where the passengers are. So it's restricted again. Plus, of course, the ship being a living ship, we have inbred sounds all the time. The ventilation, the engine noise. With the alarm masked by the distance, the sounds of the ventilation and the engines, the passengers in those cabins probably never even woke up. But 37 of the victims at the rear of Deck 5 are found in the corridors outside their cabins. These people must either have heard the commotion or the alarm. Why did they fail to escape? What mysterious breaks in the chain determined who lived and who died? A routine cruise on the ferry Scandinavian Star turns deadly when a massive fire on board leaves 158 people dead. With 30 minutes left, the alarm sounds and the people in the rear of Deck 5 try to make their escape. 37 bodies are found in the corridors. Jan Harsom's wife Christine is one of those victims. And yet, Jan, escaping from the same cabin at the same time, survives. What did they do differently? Investigators are mystified. They study the layout of the ship for clues about the mysterious death zone at the rear of Deck 5. What they find is horrifying. Fire safety engineer Professor Edgar Lear explains. The Scandinavian star had a particular problem on Deck 5 towards the aft section. You would find, you walked along, this corridor is a dead end, and the exit is just back from the end of the corridor. On the other side of the vessel, you had a similar dead end. And then to get out, you need to come back. 
Life or death lies in the instantaneous decisions people make as they struggle to escape from the confusing maze of the blazing Scandinavian star's interior. Jan Hassem, carrying his young son Halvor, turns right when he reaches these corridors. The body of his pregnant wife, Christine, is found to the left. She couldn't find an exit in the maze of corridors. He turns right, she turns left. That tiny decision means he and Halvor live and Christine dies. The investigators now understand what the victims faced trying to escape from the Scandinavian star. There is just one question about their fate that is unexplained. What actually kills them? Despite the fire's ferocity, the bodies found at the rear of Deck 5 are not burnt. So if it isn't the flames, what is it that claims the lives of so many victims? The investigator's attention is drawn to the thick smoke generated by the burning wall linings that filled the interior. Their experiments reveal the awful fact that the smoke on the Scandinavian star is particularly nasty. Not only does it contain carbon monoxide, but something equally deadly, hydrogen cyanide. Hydrogen cyanide is a, is a rapid killer. And uh, if you know some history, you know that that was the, the same gas uh, Hitler used against the Jews in the concentration camps. So it's, it's, a, it's a real killer. When hydrogen cyanide and carbon monoxide are inhaled together, the combination is devastating. Of the 158 victims, all but 10 perish by breathing the deadly smoke. At some stage before death is coming, you are incapacitated, you're unable to move, and then you're trapped, and then death is coming. And all that is taking only a few minutes in this case. Within eight to 12 minutes of the start of the fire, computer simulations suggest that the amount of toxic smoke on deck five was already reaching a fatal level. We reckon that when the captain got a message of, uh, of the fire, saw this light comes up on this board, the situation was uh, critical already for the, for the people on board. Once the toxic smoke reaches the passenger areas, the timeline becomes less exact. The victims did not survive to record them. 45 minutes after the fire starts, schmidt pedersens group calculate that the disaster is complete. The fire is out of control, the interior filled with deadly smoke. All of the victims in the cabins and the corridors have died, trapped in their cabins or lost in the interior. The first rescue vessel, the Stena Saga, is still five minutes away. But investigators remain puzzled by one thing. In an emergency situation, the crew are responsible for the safety of passengers. They're supposed to be trained to deal with emergencies. Why do they not perform better on the Scandinavian star during the disaster? The investigators check the ship's logs and registers and interview the crew. Then they unearth the truth. The seeds of the disaster were planted more than two weeks before the fatal fire. The Scandinavian star was rushed into service. The ship had only been in Scandinavian waters for 15 days. Before that, she'd been doing a completely different job, working as a casino cruise ship more than 5,500 kilometers away in Miami with a different crew. The ship's management had scheduled just 10 days to convert the ship from a floating casino cruise ship to a passenger ferry and train an almost completely new crew. It's not nearly long enough, as Master Mariner Captain Emma Tiller explains. I would not consider two weeks reasonable to train the crew up on a new vessel with a new layout. I would consider somewhere near the region of six to eight weeks to be more reasonable. Not one single fire drill had been carried out. Even more disturbingly, they discovered that many of the new crew spoke neither English nor any of the Scandinavian languages. A fact that many of the passengers had spotted before the catastrophe.
Later in the evening, I realized that many of the crew were Portuguese and didn't speak Norwegian, and to some extent, not English either. Confusion in the multilingual crew is a problem on board from the very start of the ferry's journey. When the catastrophe happens, the crew organization simply falls apart. As Leonard Norgren, captain of the rescue ship Stenosaga, explains. It turned out later that so much was missing, both in crew training and conditions on board, that they were absolutely not ready to go into service. The Scandinavian star was simply an accident waiting to happen. Yet none of this explains the final key question. How did the fire start in the first place? Investigators have worked out how a fire races through the Scandinavian star, causing catastrophe. Now they focus on how the fire started. They make a chilling discovery. It isn't the first fire on board the ship that night. 15 minutes before the fatal blaze, there was another fire. Kristen Blinheim witnessed it firsthand. It happens right outside his cabin. I tear the door open and see flames from the floor to high up under the ceiling. So, I dive to the bed, tear off my bedclothes and run out into the corridor and throw them over the flames and stamp on them to put the flames out. The captain is made aware of the fire and it's promptly extinguished. Kristen is told everything is under control, but it isn't. No one checks for another fire, no alarms are sounded, no fire doors are shut, until it's too late. Little evidence of the first fire remains, but the official report concludes that it was probably started by a naked flame. And schmidt Pedersen's investigators failed to find any evidence that the second fire could have started accidentally. Well, that led us to um, the uh, likely conclusion that, uh, that this was uh, set on purpose with a match or a lighter. Someone set the disaster fire. It was arson. As to who the arsonist is, we may never know. When police begin to go through the backgrounds of the victims, they find that one of the Danish passengers has a police record. He had four previous convictions for arson, and police suspicion turns towards him. However, the Scandinavian star had two sister ships when she worked in the US. All three of them had suffered major fires in the seven years preceding the disaster. In fact, only two years before the fatal voyage, there was a major incident on the Scandinavian star herself when her engine room caught fire. The ship was heavily criticized at the time by the US accident investigators, the National Transportation Safety Board. One of their main findings, lack of a common language amongst the crew, exactly what the Scandinavian investigators conclude. A deadly chain of events leads to the disaster. A break anywhere in the chain could have prevented or reduced the catastrophe. If the crew had been better prepared, more passengers might have been evacuated. If the captain had responded effectively to the first arson attack, the second fire might have been caught sooner. If someone had been on deck three to report the fire, it would never have gained such a deadly hold. If there'd been smoke or heat alarms in the passenger areas, the fire could have been caught when it was still small. If all the fire doors had been shut immediately, the fire would have been trapped and unable to spread. If the alarm had been louder, more of the sleeping passengers would have been roused in the rear of deck five. If the walls had been fitted with a fireproof lining that did not produce poisonous smoke. But none of these things happened and 158 people perished.
In a part of the world that prides itself on its attention to safety, this fire shakes Scandinavians to the core. It's one of their worst maritime tragedies. The official report condemns the ferry operating company and the captain. Captain Larsen and the ferry company's owner and shore manager are all given six-month jail terms for their negligence. For the survivors, the devastating effects of the tragedy remain. The dreams of 11-year-old Heidi Jensen are disturbed for years. I kept imagining that there was fire around me, around my feet. I thought there were flames everywhere. When I was in one room, I'd imagine next door was full of flames. Jan Harsum had to bring up his young son alone. He remarried 12 years later. He's since become an expert in safety at sea and devotes much of his time attempting to improve safety on ships operating across the globe. The issue of ships with inadequate safety is international. So you could be traveling in Europe, you could be in the USA, and you could at any time find yourself in the same situation, because this problem has not been resolved. But out of the disaster come some lessons and some hope. Even if the Scandinavian star had had better equipment, if she'd been more safely designed, the passengers would still have been at the mercy of substandard training and a crew that didn't even speak the same language. This was the lesson of the Scandinavian star. The accident was influential in the development of new international safety codes. These place more responsibility on the owners and operators of ships to make sure their crews are properly trained and ready for emergencies. The hope is that the tragedy of the Scandinavian star may make journeys at sea a little safer for every passenger. <laughs>